Yeah. 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 Well, good evening, ladies. We are coming around the bend for Esther. What a what an incredible study it has been. Yeah. 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 So, um, just a couple of announcements before we get started. There's going to be a prayer retreat in. Miss Lynn Raise your hand. has um, flyers about it if you're interested. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, July 14, 15, and 16. And it's at um, Rutledge. Rutledge. So she has flyers if you're interested on the prayer retreat. And you don't have to spend the night if you don't want to, but you can. You just come for meals and drop in. So see Lynn and get a flyer. Also, um, some of you have been asking about what we're doing next this is fall this will be fall right yeah. uh, so we're we're praying and there have been some ideas that have coming up so we ask you to pray um, just pray Karen will be teaching again and um, she said she keeps hearing spend time with Jesus so <laughs> I like that idea <laughs> so just pray and we're going to you know seek the Lord and he'll direct because he's faithful like that and tonight, as we finish uh, the end of Esther, this thought just came. I started reading a book called The Eternity Lens. And one of the quotes was, having an eternal perspective doesn't change what we see, but it changes how we see. And I think that the book of Esther is that glasses with the eternal perspective. Because although God isn't mentioned, he's everywhere. And sometimes we live in places where it feels like, where are you, God? He's there. And so our prayer is that all of us have been strengthened in that reality. That when it looks like it's the worst it could possibly be, he's there. And he's faithful. And he's sovereign. And so tonight we're just excited. And we want to say thank you, Karen, for just teaching us. It's been such a great time in the Word, so I'm going to lead us in prayer, and then we'll wrap up Esther. So, <laughs> Heavenly Father, we are so, so grateful for your holy, inspired Word of God. And thank you, Holy Father, that you are everywhere, in every story, in every sentence, even when you're not mentioned. And sometimes our lives feel like sentences where you're not being mentioned. God, teach us how to live with that mindset that you are faithfully writing our stories. You are faithful to complete what you have determined will come to pass. And you are faithful to keep your children, Lord. So thank you for the lessons we've learned in Esther. And we just, um, we just want to rejoice tonight. And we just want to honor you and lift you up. Because you are high and exalted and so very worthy of our praise. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So when you, or there are a lot of things you have to learn in junior high and high school that uh, you'd rather not learn, right? <laughs> Algebra, physics, you know. Remember some of those books from, uh, from uh, English literature? Anybody remember the Scarlet Letter? Yeah, great. <laughs> Um, or, or Canterbury Tales. Yeah, what is that about? I don't know. <laughs> or Oedipus Rex. Yes, not fun reading, right? So, and then there's history, right? You got a history class, and mostly history seems like it's names and dates, and yeah, why do we need to know that? Who is that guy? And this group conquered that group. Yes, yeah, so what, right? So uh, I homeschool my kids, all four kids, so I got to pick the curriculum. So this is not just unique to public school. And so the first two kids that came along into high school, I, it, the curriculum I picked was just like that, ethically boring. Oh, it was just terrible. <laughs> but by the time my second two got to high, high school, I found a different curriculum. It, it was called Mystery of History. Any of you homeschoolers out there, look for that one. And the way it was written, it gave you the who's and what's of history, but it tied it together with everything else that was going on in the world. And so it made a lot more sense because usually history is – taught from, especially here in the United States, from a United States perspective, right? And so it doesn't make a lot of sense why, you know, you explore and all this kind of stuff, but it doesn't make a lot of sense 
until you see what else is going on in the rest of the world. And when you get that, then it's like, oh, I understand why they were coming here. You know, what was going on in China was important. What was going on in Spain was important. What was going on in India was really important. And the printing press affected everything. And it was just so much more interesting, so much more connected. And um, But when you take history out of that larger context, the events don't seem to make as much impact. And it just seems to be all this disconnected information out there that has no actual relevance. And so it doesn't stick with us and it doesn't impact us, even though history is full of really exciting, interesting stories. Well, we have made it to the end of our study of Esther. And as we've seen all along the way, this is a narrative. It is a story. It's a snapshot of history, of an event that happened some 2,500 years or more ago. But the problem of reading a historical account like this, or something in Kings or Chronicles, or even up into the Gospels, and you know the things that are happening in Acts, is that we kind of fall back into that high school history mindset, and that is, yeah, I get the facts of what's happening, yeah, I know the story here, but yeah, so what? I know it's part of the Bible, so that makes me important, but really, I don't really understand why this story matters much to me, especially today in the 21st century. So that's what I kind of want to wrap up with tonight as we look at these last few verses and kind of jump back a little bit to kind of look at what Purim is all about and how it's celebrated then and today and kind of see how and pull it all the way forward into our day to see why this story and what its lessons are really are relevant to us right now today. So uh, this is a recap. A couple weeks ago, we, the Jews, have made it past the 13th day of the Jewish month of Adar, which was the date set by Haman for their destructions. And for most of the empire, one day passed, and then it was over. But earlier in chapter 9, we found out that it actually took two days, the 13th and the 14th days of the month of Adar, to put down the attacks completely. And we didn't really talk about that much last time. But uh, that's what uh, verse 15 of chapter 9 says, and why Mordecai then made this edict and made this a two-day festival, as it says here in chapter 9, verses 20 through 22. 21 says, annually, it's the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar, as the time when the, Jewish, the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration. And that's that whole reversal thing that we talked about, how God just unfolded everything that Haman tried to make happen and just turned it all around. And so uh, according to this rule, most of the empire celebrated uh, the, on the 14th day of Adar, but the Jews in Susa uh, were celebrated on the 15th day of Adar. And interestingly enough, it's celebrated like that today, that if you were Jewish and you lived outside the city of Jerusalem, then you celebrated on one day. If you live inside the city of Jerusalem, you celebrate it on a different day. So that's not set in stone. You can do it either way, but that's kind of what the <laughs> tradition is still. And so you can notice in uh, verse 22, uh, he was very specific about how the, the, the celebrations were to be, um, be observed. And he said he wrote them to observe these days as days of feasting and joy. So... Just to, so you have a little bit of background about what Purim is like, because it's not really familiar to most of us, the celebration is drawn directly out of these verses right here, and so it's first to be a celebration of feasting. Now, it's normal to celebrate with food. That's, we're Americans, we celebrate everything with food, right? <laughs> <laughs> Weddings, birthdays, Christmas, Easter, we're coming up on Memorial Day here, a lot of people be having barbecues, we're going to have food, uh, so... To us, that might be unnecessary to say that it's supposed to be with feasting, but it's a significant enough of a thing to say because it, 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 for this particular celebration, the whole story of Haman, the whole story of Mordecai and Esther is wrapped in feasting. Feasting plays a significant part in the whole thing. So remember, all the way back to the beginning of chapter 1, the story opens with a feast that Xerxes is throwing, trying to get the surrounding uh, leaders and rulers to join his campaign against the Greeks. There's a celebration when Esther becomes queen. There's, we know about two feasts that she throws for, uh, 
for uh, Haman and for Xerxes before she exposes the plot that he's, he's uh, got planned for them. Uh, there's another feast surrounding Mordecai's rise to power in chapter 8. So feasting is central to the story. So that's what they do to celebrate it. And, uh, and today there's a lot of Persian-inspired food that's served. Turkey's popular, so kind of uh, Thanksgiving-esque. Some people go completely vegetarian, supposing that Esther maybe followed the dietary rules of the Law of Moses like Daniel did, but there's no evidence that that is the case. So that's just kind of tradition that some people do. But one thing you'll almost always find at these feasts is a pastry called hamantasins, which uh, is translated means Haman's pockets. And they're play on words, likely referencing to the bribes that he took of how he lined his money, how his pockets with money. And uh, Team Woodall got together, and we made some harantasins, and they're on the back table back there. If you would like to try one, they are shortbread-esque with cherry, um, a cherry preserve in the middle. So they're not gluten-free or sugar-free or anything that, because I don't know how to do that. <laughs> it's just plain old sugar, so please enjoy one as you go tonight. And, um, you know, I had to even bring out my husband, who's the, to help me roll and pinch and all of that, but I hope you enjoyed one of those to see what it's like, because a lot of us have never been exposed to those. But so, anyway, um, then he says, and they said, it says in verse 22, that the next thing that's supposed to happen during Purim is that the giving of presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor, and that's exactly, so we got feasting and we got giving, but the, this isn't like giving Christmas gifts to your, that you send an Amazon gift card to somebody or a pair of slippers to your Aunt Betty. These gifts in Purim are specifically food. And on Purim, Jews are supposed to send two types of ready-to-eat food to uh, at least one friend, symbolizing a spirit of kinship. That is, we're all in this together, and so I'm sharing with you, you're sharing with me. And then the second gift is supposed to be um, charity, money or food to the poor so that no one should miss out on the celebration. Now remember this is especially symbolic because the celebration was born out of the edict that threatened to take everything away from the Jews. Not only did the law say that the Persians could kill them, but they could plunder all their goods, take anything they want. And so everything was threatened by their attackers. So in remembering this event and sending something of yours to someone else, a friend, and sending something to the poor, you are indicating that your trust is in God to take care of you. So you're tangibly demonstrating uh, that even in a dire, dire, a dire situation like poverty or like the threat of some outside force, that God can step in and intervene in an unexpected way fashion. So you're not relying on yourself, you're relying on God to provide whatever you need. And so like we talked about last week, the principal reason for calling it Purim is because the cell, uh, is to highlight, ironically highlight the fallacy about the nature of luck or chance. So the Purim, remember, were dice, and those were the dice that uh, Haman threw to seek the God's favor on the right day for this uh, edict to go into effect, and he was looking for their blessing on it, but this is a reminder that the destiny of God's people isn't left up to a roll of the dice, like Haman thought, and casting a lot before false gods has no impact on the future of the Jews. So the name Purim reminded them and us that God is in the one, the one who is in control of how things come out in our world. Not random chance, not luck, not chaotic forces. Not evil leaders, not impersonal laws, not rules of the land. Those things are not what impacts our future. It's God who determines the outcome of the people in Persia and the people in all generations, even up into and including ours. And that's a really great reminder that we need in our day and time. Because, you know, I was watching a baseball game just the other night, and I saw my first political ad for the 2020. 2024 presidential election. How far are we away from that, right? I mean, wow. I was like, oh, no, not already. And so this is a reminder. Uh, this message from the book of Esther is a rem reminder to us that not to have fear and anxiety every time we have an election cycle, right? Because there, 
We worry about new leaders and what they're going to do and what laws that they're going to make. And there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of arguments and a lot of discord around these things. But the, but the message to Esther is the same message to, that we have today. And it's that leaders, no matter who, how they come or who they are, don't do anything that isn't allowed by God for his purposes and under his sovereign rule. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 28? He says, all authority has been given to me. Not some authority, not most authority, not the authority that we can see, but all authority is his, and we can rest in that. And so, let's look at our verses for today. Verse 29 says, so Queen Esther, daughter of Abigail, and notice here she's got two identities. Queen Esther, Persian, and daughter of Abigail, which is her Jewish heritage. She is a woman pulled in two directions with two identities, and we'll talk about that some in your small groups tonight. It says, along with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm this second letter concerning Purim. And this is kind of funny, as you can go right over to the top of this, if you don't talk back to the beginning. Remember back at the beginning in chapter 1, Xerxes sent out this letter uh, with the whole thing about Vashti that all women in the land should be subject to their husbands, right? Remember that? But now here at the end, we have Esther here with full authority sending out official decrees. It's kind of funny, right? So this is another one of those reversals, right? And so verse, 20, uh, verse 30 and 31, we have uh, kind of a summary of the whole uh, establishing of the days of Purim. That's what it says in verse 32, kind of summary. Esther's decree confirmed these regulations about Purim, and it was written down in those records. Verse chapter 10 says, Xerxes imposed tribute throughout the empire to its distant shores. All his acts of power and might together, a full account of the greatness of Mordecai to which the king had raised him. Are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Media? And Persia. And so just a side note from these couple of verses here, Xerxes is basically the only one in the entire story who hasn't changed, right? So we have Haman is gone, Mordecai is raised to power, he's in authority. Esther isn't this shy, subservient, you know, young girl who becomes queen back in the shadows doing what she's told. She's interceded for her people. She has stepped into her own. The Jews and the Persians are all changed, but not Xerxes. He is still imposing taxes for his benefit, still uh, funding military campaigns, and making sure that the records of what he's doing is written down for everybody to remember. And then verse uh, 3 is, our, is the kind of wrap-up, and we leave the story with Mordecai, the second in command with respect to authority. Purim is established as an ongoing celebration by Mordecai and Esther, and it becomes a significant part of the Jewish uh, calendar, even Today. So, like we do every single time, what's the application of this section as we kind of wrap up this whole study? Why does this all matter? Uh, I mean, maybe you weren't born Jewish, you never celebrated Pur Purim, you're not interested in celebrating Purim, don't plan to start. But remember what I said back about history, lesson at the beginning, that history makes better sense when we put it in the context of other things going on. Same thing with the study of this part of Esther and the whole understanding of Purim is that we understand it better against the backdrop of the larger Jewish calendar, even larger, and even the larger story of this, the, God's whole story. And we can un start grasping why this is important and be encouraged not to just wrap up another story, but to live in the spirit of Purim right now, right here in our day. So a few points. Uh, about living in the spirit of Purim, we need to learn to look for God's work of deliverance and redemption. So deliverance, uh, this is what he's always about. Remember we talked about several times through the whole story is that the overarching theme of the whole book is God is always at work. God is always at work. Don't forget that. Even when you can't see his, his um, movements in your lives, remember he's behind the scenes working always. But the work that he is doing is the work of deliverance and redemption. That's the work he does all the time. Now, the Jewish calendar, like I said, to this day begins and ends in March. And so the first celebration of the Jewish calendar is Passover. Now, 
You know what that celebrates, right? Deliverance of God's people out of Egyptian bondage in glorious fashion, Moses and everything. And the last celebration of the Jewish New Year, or the Jewish calendar, is Purim, which celebrates deliverance of God's people from Haman and the Persians. Okay? So the bookends of the Jewish calendar teach the same thing. God's story of release and redemption. That's what God is always, always, always about. And it's and basically every story in the entire Bible has a, a similar thing. That is, impossible odds, hopeless situation, miraculous rescue, glorious release, complete restoration. Think about it, right? Joseph, story of Joseph in, in, the, uh, in, in Genesis, Moses, his story, Joshua, Gideon, Jehoshaphat, you know anything about the kings, jump to the New Testament, Bartimaeus, uh, the woman caught in adultery, Lazarus, it's all the same. The Apostle Paul's life, the entire book of Revelation, it is just what God is about. This is the way it goes almost every single time. And over and over and over, through story after story after story, he reminds us that there is no situation, no circumstance, no predicament, nothing bigger than God's ability to reverse and redeem. And all of these stories point us forward to the most important story that the Bible tells us. It is the message that is shouted from the cross. Sin had you down. There's nothing you could do. No to where to turn. But then God sent Jesus here to die on the cross, rise from the dead, to make possible your complete and total redemption. Egypt can't keep you enslaved. Haman can't destroy you. God delivers. God redeems. God transforms. In fact, he is the only one who can take those things meant for our destruction and turn them into a vehicle for our deliverance. Don't ever doubt that he is able. Nothing is impossible with him. This story has the miraculous work and power of God all over it. Through every single chapter, every single word, there is a constant thread of redemption through Esther's story that speaks to our lives today. Don't read this book the same ever, ever again. This is not a Disney princess story where the young girl becomes the fancy princess. That's not what this is. Remember that things in, in Esther's life had not gone the way she wanted to from the beginning. She is orphaned as a child. She lost both to her mother and her father, suffered great loss at, even at a young age. And then she was whisked away from everything she knew, every dream that she ever had, and delivered into the palace, and we talked a long time about what that looked like, and how that was not a romantic Disney princess story either, where she gets beauty treatments and is all wonderful and happy. This is not what happened to her. But even then, she, once she won the prize of the pagan drunken king in the beauty contest, <laughs> there was still incredible hardship. Her whole people group was threatened, and she had to risk her life more than once in order to intercede for them. And so God was sovereignly controlling and carefully guiding everything in this story down to the detail of a sleepless night. Okay? So remember, God is always at work, even when we can't see the whole story, even when our story is full of pain, full of hurt, full of confusion. And even when things look uncertain, God's work in and through our lives is greater than our trouble, and always his goodness shines through. Okay? Purim celebrates God's work behind the scenes to bring about what looks like it's impossible. When everything looks like it's lost, when there's no way that this can be dreamed, remember, ladies, don't give in and don't give up. Evil often looks like it's winning in this world. I mean, just turn on the social media or the news. It's screaming at us all the time. But God always has the final say. Always. Amen. That's not to say, say things are going to turn out the way we want them to. We all know that's not the case. There is loss. There is pain. There is sorrow. 
But for those who believe in Jesus Christ, those things are not the end ever. Okay? So remember that we need to look for God's hand of redemption, restoration. And we need to learn to be faithful during exile. Remember all the way back at the very, very beginning of the story, we learned why these Jewish people are in Persia to begin with. Right? Nebuchadnezzar had overrun Jerusalem many years before and dragged these people back to Babylon, and they'd been there in exile for 70 years. And so eventually, the Persians overrun, ran Babylon, and so these people were still here in uh, a foreign land. They were displaced. They weren't living at home anymore. They were in exile. And exile is an experience of disorder, of displacement, often chaos, when you, uh, when time, home seems really far away, things don't make a lot of sense, people are making rules that you don't understand, they're not keeping what, what, how you've always lived. Sound familiar? <laughs> it's kind of right, right now, right? And so yet the story of Esther and Purim shouts to us that God is still working. He is always in control, even when we feel like we're living in a foreign land. So we don't just have to tuck our heads down and uh, hope for the best, we as believers in Jesus can live in faith while we still sojourn in darkness, in exile, because we can be assured that he brings light, because he is the light. The book of Esther is not quoted in the New Testament, but you know its themes are there? And once that Esther we've studied and been through uh, this long in the book, you can start to see them. And so uh, the, uh, remember I told you that Old Testament stories are... Uh, pictures of New Testament principles. So I found this passage in actually in 2 Thessalonians, and, and it, it, Paul kind of gives us the themes of Esther and what he says in this. Look at it and see if you can see the themes here. In verse 6 of 2 Thessalonians 1, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This has happened when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. And he will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the day of the, uh, the Lord draws nearer and nearer for us. The promise is for what? A complete reversal, just like we saw in the book of Esther. One day relief is coming, like verse 7 says there. And the enemies of God, using uh, Esther language, will hang on their gallows. And, or as he says here, he will pay back trouble to those who trouble you, like in verse 6. Verse 9 of the same chapter says, They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. So believers are going to get rest. Those who oppose the Lord will receive a just reward. And what verse 9 says here, which is everlasting destruction and being separated from the presence of the Lord forever. And then verse 10 hints at what's coming and what's waiting for God's faithful followers. And just like in the book of Esther, what is it going to be but a glorious feast? And so living in the spirit of Purim, we need to anticipate the coming celebration. A celebration is coming, ladies, that is beyond what we can imagine. This feast ushers in rescue that is complete and a rest that will endure Forever. Revelation 9, uh, 19, 1 and 2. Verse 1 reminds us of God's sovereign control. And verse 2 hints at um, uh, that God, uh, God uh, not hints at, tells us that God will right the wrongs and defend his people. Skipping down to verse 6 of the same chapter. Then I heard what was sounded like great multitudes, like a, a, the roar of rushing waters. Like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. Here's the celebration for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. And then verse 9, then the angel said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words. Of God. Celebration and rejoicing. The reversal is complete. A wonderful day to look forward to. But in the meantime, we remain exiles, don't we? A couple of places Peter calls us strangers and aliens. Because that's really what we are, aren't we? 
as our culture t- continues to diverge away from God's design, I think we're going to feel that a lot more. I think we know that things are not right in the world, right? You can feel it inside of you. You can hear these things and you go, this is just not the way it should be. Forces seem to be working against us and there's just more, more confusion almost every day. But instead of being frustrated, we who are believers or trying really hard to make things work out the way we want them to, we can dwell in the spirit of plural. We can acknowledge that things are amiss. We can trust that God is always working, even when we can't see it. And we can be assured that there's a feast coming, ladies. We can get up tomorrow morning, no matter what has happened yesterday, celebrate in the anticipation of the coming culmination of promises. Of God. So don't be afraid of plots and schemes of governments. Don't be afraid of evil intent of people who want to do you harm, whether it's inside your family, at your job, or complete strangers. Don't let the sins of your past press into your future. Because Satan is working, but he does not win. We can be sure of that and 100% certain. Because it says, if God is for us, who can be? Against us. And as a believer in Jesus, God is for you. Not to give the thing, you the things that you want that are outside of his will, but ultimately to strengthen you, to uphold you, to bring about restoration and hope. We can trust him, ladies, all <laughs> the time. So push yourself to live in the spirit of Purim right now, rejoicing that Christ has come. Evil has been dealt with. Death has been crushed, and as Jesus said from the cross, it is finished. Victory is yours through faith in him. It is an absolute reality right now. We're not waiting for some future date. He has given you the victory over sin, the world, and your flesh. So one day we're going to pull up to the table. We're going to enjoy the sweet fruit of its completion, Uh, but you don't have to see it completely right now to know that it is real. It is real and I mean knowing it not just up here in your head or something you talk about in Bible class or you hear from a pulpit sometimes, but knowing it in your soul, in your bones with unshakable certainty. And When we have that, it will change the flavor of your life. There will be a lightness to your conversation, to your outlook, a joyful filter through which you see everything, like Sandy said, an eternal perspective. And it ought to help you loosen your grip on the things of this world as we grasp hold of the things in the future. Let go of those things that weigh you down and pull you down from your past. Not be so fearful of things you hear in the news or in the culture. Accept forgiveness from God and then give it more freely to other people. Hold the hand of people around you instead of holding grudges and believe that this world is not all there is. So regardless of what we encounter on the way, we can face it with that certainty. Christ has come. Christ has conquered. Christ reigns. And Christ is coming again. A celebration is coming. We all, as believers in Jesus, have a seat at the table and this feast is going to surpass the, uh, the grandeur of the wealth and the extravagant of the Persian Empire at its height and going to be more joyous than the celebration of those Jews on that first celebration of Purim. We can join with other believers from all the span of time and marvel of God's handiwork that spanned across eons, finally seeing how he took the big events of history, wove them together with the details of your life and produced a tapestry that shouts to the glory of God. And in that moment, you're going to be able to see how these most dramatic and desperate moments that you had, that God was there in your life, weaving his will, tying things together in unseen ways because he was, he is, and he shall forever be sovereignly working for our good and for his So don't let this be the end of just another Bible study where you go out of here and we don't think about Esther ever again. But you carry the message of Esther 
and the Spirit of Pouring with you. When things are confusing, when you don't feel like God's doing anything in your life, open this story up again. Read through it. Remind yourself of the constant work of God toward restoration, toward reversal, and live in anticipation of that joyous celebration and of its full completion. Amen? Amen. That is where we end, Esther, and I hope that this has challenged you, encouraged you, and um, it will uh, take with you, will take it with you as you go on into other studies around in the in the Bible. So God, we just want to thank you for who you are. I want to thank you for home, that our home is not here, that you have secured a place for us, and that we don't have to live in fear of what happens around us. God, give us the faith to trust you. Give us the faith to look for you when you are hidden or when you seem to be hidden and that we can find you, find your fingerprints in every little small detail in the big things that are going on. God, let us shut down the voice of the enemy who tells us that you are not faithful and know that you have demonstrated your love once and for all in the death of your son on our behalf. We thank you for that, and we join with the angels to sing hallelujah, our God reigns. In Jesus' most mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Our last discussion. Don't forget to try a cookie, either here or on your way out. What was it called again? Common talking. What? Common talking. Haman Tossin is common talking. Oh, common Tossin, but Tossin. How do you spell the last part? Oh, let me see. It's really wrong. <laughs> <laughs>